My name is Dave Burian. Uh, I've been a really big fan of George Romero and Tom Savini's films for years and years. Um, I first got into it when I was a teenager. Uh, I kind of started when I was very young uh, with comic books initially. I uh, moved on to the creepy, eerie, worn magazines. And then when I was about 16, it happened to be the same time that uh, videos started coming out that you could rent, the VHS and Beta Wars were going on. But I was at the age that I could finally just start getting um, the 17, you know, the R-rated films that just started coming out. So I was able to rent them at the same time. And so we would have these parties in the basement where we'd just go crazy on the weekends with me and my high school friends. And we'd have sometimes double, triple features. We had a finished basement. We had one of the few families that had a big screen TV at the time. We were very fortunate. And I would watch all these crazy movies like Dawn of the Dead. They all came out almost at the same time within this short time span. Dawn of the Dead came out. Creepshow was out. Actually, that had just in 82 had been, you know, I went to see that. In fact, the day it came out, I saw it um, with a couple of my friends. But at this, at this time, I got to watch all these different films. Um, and a lot of them were Romero films. And I also was into Fangoria, like most other people. The collecting part came into it when I was um, doing computer work with Tom. Because he needed kind of like, uh, he needed some help. Because he was doing, I think it was back when he was still using Windows computers. And I was good at fixing problems when you get a blue screen or an error or a printing problem or something like that. And so I would come over and just help him clear stuff out like that and I would take care of it. And what would happen uh, is instead of getting paid, I would ask him, well, is there something maybe else that we could exchange for this? And that's honestly how I started collecting. The only one that I got from Tom was EG, who's sitting there. And that was a point when Tom had, this was before he had his school and before he had a lot of these things too, you have to remember was, this was back in the late 90s and around 2000 and Tom hadn't been doing a lot of television. I think he would, had been doing Vampirates, like that was what he had planned at the time. He had grown his very long beard. And um, it was in between a lot of things for him. So I have a feeling if he'd been really busy and doing a whole lot of things that this circumstance might not have come up or I'd have the opportunity to get these things. But just things kind of all came together in my favor at that time that I was able to, to come upon that. So I asked him, I had seen the, the EG there. I thought, well, gosh, this was the coolest thing from Creepshow. And he wound up selling that one off. <laughs> It stood the test of time as far that it's, it's still together. It's starting to get very frail as um, the foam latex will do. It's, uh, it does need to be, it, it probably would be, need to be restored at some point. It certainly needs to be like in a, in a case. Um, but it, fairly frail, but not frail enough that I'd be terrified to take it anywhere. But I'm just real um, nervous about taking it out because all it needs is a bump or something and you can press on it. It's kind of hard you know, on the outside. so. I try to be really selective about where I take it. Well, I got a phone call from someone that needed to, <laughs> had been in a car accident, and the person happened to be George Romero's personal assistant at the time. And he had asked, he, he knew that these things kind of find their way to me, because at, at that time, that's what was happening as I was starting to get a, a small collection. And he wanted to know if I'd be able to. And I, I said to him at the time, if you would want to sell this, I said, I know you can probably get you know, more money for it if you would put it up for auction somewhere on eBay, or such, which was really the only venue at the time, I think. There weren't a lot of other venues. I said, you want to do that? That's fine. I said, but if you put it up and you don't sell it, or you don't get what you want for it, because I was offering a certain amount, it was, we thought it was OK you know, at that time. It was reasonable. And he said, all right, well, I'll just sell it to you because I'll get the cash right away and I don't have to wait and, it, you know, there won't be any ifs about it. And that's what happened. I, we got the phone call, was able to get the cash together, loaded it in the back of the truck and brought it home. And that's how I wound up getting with that. But the interesting story about that is he said that uh, George's kids at the time were terrified of it. And George had given it to him, which is the, but that was the reason why he got rid of it because he was really afraid. Uh, the kids were really afraid of it and they, they didn't want to, were afraid to go up to his office. I'm glad I was able to take it off his hands, but not at the, you know, the detriment in that circumstance, but we still have it, I still have it now, and, and uh, I still like to show it to people when I can.
There was a cover for Cine Fantastique that uh, featured Stephen King and Tom and also George on the cover, and they had some other props from, I think they had Fluffy's Claw coming out and a couple other things from, from the film. And you can see him sitting on it, and actually on, the, on this particular crate, you can see there's an indentation where somebody sat uh, on the corner of it where it's kind of pushed in. But you could also match it from the, the way that the blood spatters on the front and on the side also. But this was, there were, from what I understand, there were three different um, crates that there were. And John Harrison has a smaller one. I know this was on another DVD that was released. John Harrison has one. Tom had one initially, and he uh, gave that. I think he exchanged that one for something with Greg Nicotero. And then this was the one that George had up in his office. This was the, the bloody one that had all the nastiness on it from the, the I th think the, the basic uh, blood spatter on this was where it was sideways and you can see the janitor gets, because uh, this has the hole in the bottom of it. So there's one, there's a great picture out there as a, a photo of Tom dressed up as Fluffy and you can see it where he's poking his head through and he just did that to do the, the blood spatter. You can see him like, with a syringe in there on the Fluffy costume where you could just see his, his hand on that. What? It's a comic book. What? It's a comic book. It's a comic book. As far as I'm concerned, the, the Creepshow comic really is the film because it takes each of the stories and it you fan it out. Um, the comic book itself represents where you can, it freeze frames on a particular frame and then it transitions as you look at the comic over to the next story. And in some instances you see Obviously, the, the different panels of the advertising and the one with the... Uh, there are several that you can't see very well that you can see in the comic itself. But it switches in between. So to me, that was really the representation of the, the film to me. And I thought, well, if I could have any prop from the movie, you know, the crate is, is wonderful. E.G. is really the classic ultimate gross out. I think that Stephen King would call it. But to me, the comic book would have been the ultimate thing to have. Um, only because it, it was so representative of those earlier comics that I was such a fan of. When I'm really interested in having something, I can be a really great pesterer. And this is what happened with Rick Catazone and I had seen each other on and off at different conventions over the years. And I had just been a fan of his work and I had bought some cells from him over, over the years. And I, I knew he was interested in selling it at some point. And like I do with some of the other people, I said, you know, I. I'd love to buy this. I probably can't give you what it's worth, but if you sell it to me, you'll have rights to see it again and then check it out and borrow it if you'd like to or what have you, that you could get it back and, and you know that it's at least um, at hand and available and not on somebody's shelf or in someone's drawer somewhere or, or overseas. And he finally, after years of doing this, three or four years, he finally relented and I was able to pick it up from him at home. And I just, I'm very ecstatic about that fact. I think he's, He's a little nervous about me having it because I do like to share it with people, but it's still in perfect shape. I have, it hasn't been damaged, there's no cuts, there's no uh, tears in it. I've really been careful when I, when I do share it with other people. The interesting thing about the comic book is that it's really just a drop-in. It's not an actual entire comic book that you would uh, purchase in a store. Um, the Father's Day segment, the colored version of the, the Father's Day and the Lonesome Death of Jordy Verrill, there's actually only the first, uh, the entire story of Father's Day and just the first part of Jordy are intact. Uh, I asked Rick about that and he has no idea what happened to the story. At some point somebody, either the pages were lost or somebody took them or he doesn't have any idea where it's located. but. There's only those two that are missing, but the rest of it in, is intact. I've been so fortunate to have the circumstances that have kind of befallen me and that I was able to meet Tom. I was able to meet George several times um, over his, uh, the latter part of his life. Uh, wonderful, super guy. I mean, George was just something else. He was always very personable and um, just a wonderful human being to me. Even as the few times I had met him, uh, the couple times I met, I spoke with him in person. You just got that feeling for him. That you just threw this vibe out to everyone. That I just really miss him a whole lot. As far as being a collector, um, I kind of feel like uh, 
a keeper of things, almost like in the EC Comics, where you get to hold on to something and curate it and kind of keep it for yourself, but at the same time, there's nothing I enjoy more than sharing it with other people and other fans. And that's really the case I, I tell to a lot of people, as I, I've always been a fan first. I wasn't really a collector first. I got these pieces because I love the films and was a huge fan of the films. And I never bought them to sell or to resell like an investment. And I really stress that to people because a lot of collectors will come up and like, how much do you want for this? Or how much do you want of that? Or do you want to trade? And, and when I explain to them, if I trade or I get rid of this, I'm not going to have it ever again. And I won't be able to share with other people. And that's what I really enjoy. And the people that look at online and, the, and all the different communities and people that I've met at conventions since then over the years that I've been able to share with them, especially the people from overseas, they're just so pleased that we're able to do that. And it's, it really, I get very excited because that's what I enjoy doing is to share with those folks because most things sit on a shelf somewhere or they're in somebody's, they're under glass or they're behind something that you can never access them again. And it's a big kick for me to be able to share those with the people that made the films and the people that love the films like myself.